So hi everyone, welcome to this session. So this is where we start project one. And project one is inclined towards microservices deployments. And it ha also has an amazing front end. So I'll just walk you through all of these different components on this page that you're seeing right now. And this is an architecture diagram, thanks to Lucid Chat. We can create amazing architecture diagrams over here. So I'll explain each and every component individually and what we are going to do in project one. And I'll also give you a small hint in regards to what we'll be doing in project two and three. And project one is going to be after the orchestration section. So therefore you do learn about uh, microservices deployments using ECS and so on. So let's get started. So in this diagram over here, you can see that we have one database. So let's start from the database. So we have one RDS instance over here. That is going to be a common instance where we are going to have a, a schema that is related to all of the different microservices that we do develop. And uh, it's going to go ahead and connect to the database in order to retrieve data, in order to uh, update data, in order to insert new data, or even to delete data and so on. So that's called as CRUD operations or create, read, update, delete operations. And we are going to develop these microservices in Spring Boot so that you also get an idea of what Spring Boot does, what kind of capabilities it allows us to do, and how easy it is to bootstrap an application, and how easy it is also to create your REST endpoints or your REST APIs. So therefore, we'll be creating one microservice, and then you can go creative and create multiple microservices. But I'm going to show you as to how to create one microservice and connect it to a MySQL database in the backend, and where will that microservice be running? So now you have four different options over here, out of which we are going to choose one option. So the first option that you do have is, you can go with an artifact that you upload to an EC2 instance and directly host your microservice from that EC2 instance. That is one way of doing the hosting. But then we are in a world where we are working with containers. So therefore the second way of doing a deployment would be to use containers. So therefore we are going to dockerize our microservice with a context path and we are going to take the docker image, upload it to ECR, which is Elastic Container Registry, and then go ahead and start our container with that application running with an ECS, which is a cluster of Docker instances. Or you can also go with the Fargate profile where you don't need to manage the instances on your own. So this is the second way of deployment, but then building upon this deployment, the third way of deployment would be go ahead with the same dockerizing, go ahead with the same containerization, but then this time you go with Kubernetes clusters where you get that orchestration and scheduling capabilities and all of the different advantages that Kubernetes provides you with. So in that case, you can go with EKS, which is Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is a hosted service on AWS for Kubernetes workloads. The fourth way of doing the deployment would be to re-architect your application in such a way that you can go with serverless deployment. So you can use Lambda and API Gateway for your middleware. So therefore you got your backend, which is your database. It can be MySQL, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, Oracle SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server, and so on. Out of which we'll be choosing MySQL. And for the middleware deployment, we'll be going with ECS clusters where we have two instances in two different IBD zones. And I'll show you the scaling, the, uh, I mean, going ahead and deleting a service so that you can see how it automatically spawns up again and we will be registering our microservice to a load balancer. And that load balancer will be registered with an alias name on route 53, which is nothing but our API and for a specific environment, which is dev. So the same setup, you can replicate it to different environments, depending on how much cost you would like to incur based on the environments that you set up. You can have one for dev, you can have one for QA, one for stage and one for production or you can have one for dev, one for QA, and directly it can go to production. Okay. So here we will also be working with auto scaling groups. So all the concepts that we studied in the previous sections will all be summarized over here. So therefore, in our middleware, we are going to go with Java Spring Boot based application, which is going to be hosted onto Elastic Container Service as a, a Docker a container, where our application will be running. And then it will be registered to the load balancer, where we'll be registering a separate uh, Route 53 domain name for our load balancer itself. And our database on the backend, where we'll probably be using MySQL, it's also going to have its own entry in Route 53, where we are going to have 
uh, uh, instead of the randomized domain name that uh, RDS provides us with, we will have a domain name along the lines of the application name hyphen db hyphen the environment name dot your domain name. So that is for the database. So everyone can just remember this in order to connect to the database rather than the automated generated domain name that RDS provides. So now let's move on to the front end. So now we should be able to go ahead and visualize our uh, front end with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, so that we at least have a web page. And that is going to internally interact with our backend API endpoint, which is hosted on the load balancer, which is going to go ahead and interact with our application that is running as containers, which is going to interact with our backend database, which is MySQL. So now you get an idea of how a full stack developer thinks. So what is going to be your front end then? For this particular use case, we have chosen Angular to be our front end framework and our Angular code will be built and deployed to our S3 bucket. And from there on, we'll be having cloud front and front of in order to retrieve all of the objects because we would like to have that low latency capability of deploying our application globally to all of the edge locations. And then in order to protect our application, we are going to have a web application firewall and by internally by default, a cloud front comes with shield standard. So we do get that advantage of DDoS mitigation from shield standard. And then we are going to register our domain name in route 53, which is going to translate to the cloud fronts automated domain name. And the front end domain name is going to be called as front end hyphen dev dot zero initiative.com. Okay. So now you, I, I hope that you do get an idea wherein you have a front end where you're going to just visualize. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to list a table on the front end, right? When the page loads, and then you have a backend where your microservices are running, where you do have APIs exposed onto the load balancers endpoint. And then for your database, you do have a MySQL database where actually your data is being stored. So you can have this MySQL database reside within a private subnet for much more secure uh, uh, capability as well as encrypt all of your data at rest. You can also encrypt your data in transit by associating ACM or SSL certificates. We can associate an SSL certificate with our load balancer for encryption in transit. By default, we can go ahead and uh, get encryption in transit with CloudFront, but you can also associate your own ACM certificate in order to get that. And we are going to go ahead and associate an object access identity or OAI or origin access identity to your CloudFront distribution in order to fetch all of your contents from the bucket. But then you can't directly access your bucket. You have to access it only through the CloudFront distribution. So again, these are the security aspects that you can think of. Encryption at rest, encryption in transit, uh, using your own SSL certificates, and then also go with the origin access identity capability of CloudFront. Place your database within your private subnet. Even your entire application as your microservices can be within private subnets. So I'm just giving you guys a lot of different ideas as to how you would do this architecture and how you would improve upon this. So one other way to improve upon this is to also go ahead and have a DevOps cycle where you, as and when you go ahead and commit your code to a repository, it's going to automatically build your code and then deploy it to your ECS cluster so that you always have the latest version of your backend microservices running. You can have one separate pipeline for your front end code. So as and when you are going ahead and changing your front end code, it's creating a new build artifact of your code and deploying it to the S3 bucket as a new version. So you can have versioning enabled on your S3 bucket. So this is one more improvement to this architecture. So for, for the next few video lectures, what we are going to do is we are going to implement this entire architecture. I'm going to have my source code in GitHub. So that means I'll also be able to show you the Git related commands if you guys are not familiar with that. And then I'm going to walk you through the code and then we are going to start building out the database first. And then we are going to start building out the middleware code second. And then finally we'll be wrapping it up with the front end code. And then I'll show you this entire deployment as to how it works and you can go ahead and be more creative. And one more thing to note over here is since we are going to use only one microservice, if you do have multiple microservices, how will they be able to interact with each other? These microservices can also interact with each other using the HTTP protocol. So if you have three microservices registered to the load balancer, you can ensure that all these three microservices talk to each other only through the load balancer's DNS name with that respective context path once they have been deployed. That is also possible. Or you could possibly use something along the lines of a service mesh if you're going ahead with a Kubernetes solution. But let's keep it simple for right now because Kubernetes is something that is extensive. We will keep it simple. We will go with one microservice which talks to the database and then we are going to have our Angular code deployed to the front end to an S3 bucket with CloudFront in front of it 
and we are going to register our domain names for the front end, for the APIs, for the back end database. Okay. So I hope you got a good idea as to what we are going to implement over here. Follow through with the next few lectures and you will find out that it's very useful for you guys. Okay. And similarly for project two and project three, for project two, we are going to have a DevOps project. For project three, we are going to have a serverless project. So all the three great technologies in the market, microservices, DevOps, serverless. Each and every one of these technologies will have a project of its own. And please do do these projects. Please don't miss this out. It's going to be a very good learning for you, all of you. Okay. So thank you all for listening to this section. I'll catch you in the next one where we go ahead and start deploying our uh, services and cloning our repositories. So thank you and have a great day. Stay safe. I'll catch you in the next session. Bye-bye.